Welcome to Commander Central, episode 18, hashtag winning. We're going to talk about winning at Magic, winning at life, and winning in the Alabama special election, where apparently it helps to not be a mall diddler. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> Um, before that, we'll see if there's any in- anything interesting happening in the world of Commander. We will hit up social media. We will talk about games we played, and we will just generally talk about life. I'm Dana. I'm Max. And I'm Chris. Is everyone feeling the Christmas spirit here at Commander Central? Sure. Yep. It's cold, it's snowing, and I have had four or five Amazon packages show up, so I'm actually, ready. I actually carried one in when I got here when I walked up to the front porch. I saw one of Max's Amazon packages. What was in it? Um, I don't know if he opened it. At least he didn't open it when I, I was I, there. I did. It was uh, like La- Lingerie. Not- no, oh. <laughs> nylon mats for like baking on instead of using like parchment paper, you put them on your cookie sheet. Oh, I need some of those. They're like 10 bucks for two of them on Amazon. We use a lot of uh, tin foil for our stuff. Yep. Saves yep. you from having to scrub your cookie sheets when stuff gets burned. Is that like a mom gift? Yes. That's clever. I'll have to look at those. Um, is your Christmas shopping done so far? I guess that's the question. Since Max bought that, is everybody else, is everything else taken care of? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> oh, two no. or three more things to get that'll be gotten this weekend how about you chris uh, for the most part uh, i know that we're gonna have a friend's christmas in january and then gotta figure out what my brother and his girlfriend are doing because they're the only pretty much the only family that's still around here on my side so i have to take my son out to buy something for my wife at some point um and i want to buy her something else because so i, I she wanted some earrings for christmas so we went and got those this weekend because she wanted a specific pair and then she wanted to wear them so like we just went and got them <laughs> so she put them in and she also wanted canisters um, for a counter in the kitchen. So, like, you know, put sugar in one, put flour in one. Because we have some, but they're 10 years old and kind of falling apart. Um, so I went and I bought her canisters and, and wrapped them up, put them under the tree. Way, like, this was like two weeks ago. So I've. You were ahead of the curve. I was way ahead of my usual Christmas shopping. Um, except for she immediately walks in the door and is like, oh, I see you got me those canisters for Christmas. And that was when I kind of realized, oh, well, yeah, they're because I wrapped them up. I didn't put them in a box. They're clearly four canisters of the Christmas tree. <laughs> Oopsie. Um, and I tried to lie to her about it. I mean, not like seriously, but I was like, no, those are cans of oatmeal. Oh, <laughs> no. Wait. And, uh, you know, like that's, you know, one of them's instant oats and one of them is steel cut oats. And, and then I not, I'm like, one of them's not steel cut oats. So like, <laughs> there was two kinds of oats I could think of. And that was the end of it. Um, so I need to get her something that she can't guess what it is at this point. So now are you going to go buy her oatmeal then? Is that I the should thing? Just, right. I'm going to take the canisters out and actually wrap up cans of oats. You should put the oatmeal in the canisters. Just like open all the packets <laughs> right, of yeah. instant oatmeal and dump them in dump there. Dump it all in there. The steel cut oats and the uh, non-steel cut oats. So that's the last thing I need to get her something she's not expecting. You have a week. I've a got, week and a half. Yeah, I've got plenty of time. I, I did that to my wife one year. Told her she was getting nothing. And then the week before Christmas, she really wanted a heated jacket. Like, she was talking about it all year. So I ended up buying her a really nice Milwaukee heated jacket, which for all you guys who have wives or girlfriends, they are phenomenal. They will never complain about it. Best gift ever. Well, told her she was getting nothing. So Christmas night, or Christmas Eve, I went down, I wrapped it, put it in a huge box, wrapped it with a whole bunch of styrofoam and everything, so she had to go digging through it, put it in front of her Christmas tree. Needless to say, it took up, like, the whole living room, this box did. (laughs) She came downstairs, saw it, and I got the death glare because she thought we were doing no gifts, and I got nothing that year. But it's the best gift I, gift that I ever got her. I th- this is not a Christmas gift story, but this was before I was married to my wife when we were dating. Um, but we had just started living together, and it was like the second year or something for her birthday. Um, her birthday was on a Monday, and I hadn't got her a gift yet. But I was planning on going on a Sunday or Saturday or something. But we had to do like a work project. Uh, it would have been a Saturday night. I had to work. Um, we were upgrading some network equipment or something. So I went in thinking, you know, then on Sunday I'll get her present. And then something went like catastrophically wrong. Oh, <laughs> no. So we were, but we were there not only like all night Saturday, but all day Sunday. I didn't come home. I didn't get done till Monday morning. So we were there for like 48 hours working on this thing. And I drove home like delirious Monday morning from lack of sleep. But I didn't go home because it was her birthday that day. So I drove to the mall and went into, I don't remember what store it was. And but I can't, I could, at that point in time, my brain is not functioning. So I bought like six things. Like I bought her a pair of boots and like a pair of pants and like a shirt. <laughs> and, I, and like roughly her size. And I walked home and I'm like, I'm really sorry, honey. I, uh, this is too much stuff. This was like four hundred dollars and stuff. Pick two things you want. We'll return the rest. I'm going to bed. Night. 
And she was like, that's a freebie. You can get that one. I understand. <laughs> but it was a bunch, like some of the stuff was like totally awful too. Like just this ugly pair of pants. I remember one of them, one of the things were, <laughs> but I was, my brain was not functioning. I was just like, I had been awake for days. Oh, that is great. So, I love that. How about games we played this week? Anything cool happen? Yeah. I taught a new person that they should always listen to me. Because I am a genius when it comes to Commander. So I, I know what this story is kind of because I, I actually at one point heard this is you're at a different table entirely like the other half of the room. But at one point I heard someone say something about Vraska assassins. Yes, tokens. Vraska assassins with um, uh, Venser. His, minus uh, minus one. Is it one or two or whatever? It's minus gives one. Them, gives them all unblockable or whatever. But earlier in the game, this player decided to attack me instead of killing the Vraska. Like I clearly said should happen because Vraska was open, didn't have death touch at the time. So they just kept attacking me and Vraska kept ticking up. So I had to use all my resources to stay alive. And then Vraska alts and I let it just go. Let, like, let uh, that person uh, learn the <laughs> lesson. And then they apologized up and down like, oh, I should have listened. And I'm like, well, next time I was like, I'm not, I'm not trying to <laughs> screw over the game or anything. Just trying to teach you that that was what the problem was. You know, when we eventually, if we make t-shirts or something for this podcast, yours is going to say, you should listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> I've been proven right, whether it's board games or other stuff, it's just, there's certain times it's just like, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that, you, shouldn't, you should listen to me, you should listen to me, and it always goes horribly wrong for them if they don't. That's how we learn, we touch the fire. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I did that when I was younger, I know better. <laughs> I would have to give credit where credit's due. That's from uh, my friend. Steve. From friend Steve. No, it's from Mike. It Mike was from that. Mike. So I shout out to Mike for the, uh, that's how we learn we touch the fire. You don't <laughs> need your hand. <laughs> right. Fine. Um, I had a Nekizar game. I haven't seen Nekizar in forever. I didn't even know he existed anymore. The, the one thing I really noticed, and I remember this from years ago when Nekizar got played, but pretty quickly the player played a Lilianas Caress, which is two damage whenever you discard a card. Um, and then Magus to the wheel next turn. Yep. So I'm like, oh, okay, so as soon as that Magus gets cracked, we all take 14 damage. And if Nekizar's out, we take another 7 damage. I'm like, I'm just going to kill you. And that's the problem with Nekizar. It's always been the problem with Nekizar is it's easy just to kill, just kill a Nekizar player. It's kind of a per- perforos is kind of the same way a little bit. Like, you know what the strategy is. There's no two ways about it. And you can just kill the person. They usually can't stop you from killing them. That's a bad co- with those color combinations. You don't really have ways of protecting yourself once you're online, right? That's that. So that's a thing that I, I don't think comes up enough talking about strong commanders. Is sometimes there's that weird balance point where your commander is strong to the point where people are just going to kill you and you can't prevent it necessarily, or it's difficult to prevent anyway. I had a euro a euro game with a jerk, um, just an oh, awful, shots awful fired. human being <laughs> um, named Chris who. Won the game at the end. I should not have won that game, though. There was a couple of misplays. Um, I had top-decked an Exsanguinate when you were tapped out and the third player was tapped out. I had eight life at the time. You, and I had enough mana to kill you, but the, I thought the third player, I don't know. I looked at his life total, and I'm like, oh, he's at 19. But he was at nine. I don't know if, if there was a dice nearby that I was, or if I just wasn't, I don't know what the deal was. But So I'm like, well, I can't kill him, so maybe I'll wait one turn knock his life down, or, 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 or maybe you'll swing with Euro or something at him, then I can do it next turn. And I waited too long, and then he had counterspell mana free. So he countered my Exsanguinate, which he probably shouldn't have done. He probably should have, because he said he had a Sphinx's Rev in hand too. Yeah, he, he should have Sphinx's Rev to gain the life to survive it, but I don't know if he would have been able to stabilize after that anyways. But you definitely don't want, if like you can kill the person with Euro wearing 14 year auras, you want to <laughs> you want to do that. Um, but anyway, that was my screw up for not paying attention to life totals. And I had a, a pretty decent recce game um, where I got to use Baru Fistacrosa to put a bunch of landfall triggers down and kill a couple people, including Max. Yeah, I died to a. To a what's the throne? Dragon Throne Dragon of Tarkir, Tarkir on a Pelucranos. Who I had put five counters on, killing your Archangel Athun. Yep. And then you made everything like plus 15, plus 15, and yeah, killed the table. It was something. Uh, that was an Ekizar game, actually. Was it? Yeah. Yep. So okay. um, I took a picture of that on social media, and you can see it on Twitter. So speaking of social media, anything else on the format you want to talk about, Chris? Yeah, uh, we heard from Dan Mel up on our YouTube for the Dorn video that we put up. He just basically said uh, one of his first decks was a Treefolk Tribal. 
And he says that when he builds a deck, he strives to add cards that cover multiple utility effects. Be it removal, card advantage, land ramp, uh, card selection, etc., etc. Um, basically, that's pretty much what we do, isn't it? Pretty much, yeah. That sounds exactly like how I would build a deck. Yep. He had some good suggestions um, for cards he would have added. Um, yep. The one I liked the most and that I felt kind of bad about missing was Vindicate. I just forgot it was a, it was a sub $10 card. I think it's just since we've been playing, it's always been so, such an expensive card that... Now that's dropped in price, you just forget about well, it. Well, there's, there's two things. Number one, it was always expensive. And number two, Anguish and Making and Outer End in the same colors, being instant speed are and being exiled better. are so much better. Yep. I would still run probably run Vindicate because it hits any permanent, but yeah, it's kind of been eclipsed a little bit. Yes. In that deck, though, as a bargain um, card, I would probably still run it. Yep, I can get behind that. If, if there wasn't the bargain caveat, I would probably run Maelstrom Pulse first. Yeah. Um, the ability to hit a token wave with Maelstrom Pulse is really, really useful. Oh, Maelstrom Pulse is a beauty. Yeah, but that's a v- that's like a $25 card that's right now. Right. So, that is yeah. not a cheap card. No. Um, we also heard from James Arnquist on Twitter at JJJAMES is across <laughs> the board, 47. <laughs> Totally just butchered your Twitter handle. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, he was said that he was surprised that none of us mentioned Meek Stone. I, I, for, I just based on it and forgot I, it. For I the most did part. too. I mean, I even run the card in Brago, and I guess I just abuse it with the, the blink triggers, so I never really worry about it. I just kind of forgot that it would be perfect for a Doran deck. In this particular Doran deck, he had there was quite a few creatures that were like three sixes or four yeah. sevens or something, so maybe it wouldn't work as well in, as it would in some decks. Yep, Seeing how he zero. wanted to go more Tree Folk Tribal type of deal. But if you're going like straight up Doran, where you're like putting in as much value as you can, like one sevens, that kind of stuff, yeah. then wow, Meek Stone would be a boss. Yeah, it's a good card. Totally. Um, I have seen it kind of screw people before where they play it and the guy running the elf deck is like, oh, that's cool. That's my other <laughs> It just enables other people. Maybe it doesn't enable you as much. But, I mean, then you just don't cast it. You need to just pay attention to your board state and not do it if it's that's the situation. Right. Um, we also got, speaking of social media, um, Jason Alt of Brainstorm Brewery fame hooked me up with a six-pack of Shorts Brew Soft Parade. Um, I sent him a six-pack about a month or so ago yep. um, of New Glarus Blacktop, and he sent me this back in response. So the three of us are drinking the uh, Soft Parade right now as we record. I like it. It's different. It is. It feels Christmassy. I will. I will say yeah. that it's a very fruity beer. It is very fruity. Kind of reminds me of a, a wine almost uh, for how fruity it is over yep. a, an actual beer. A little bit. It's definitely a dessert beer. Yes, for sure. But it's very good. And thank you very much for that, Jason. I will also mention he's been just killing it on Twitter all day today with <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> with Roy Moore jokes. Um, I can't read all the jokes because a lot of them aren't all age appropriate. And this one probably isn't either. But I'm going to say it anyway. Um, he wrote, Roy Moore still hasn't conceded because if there's one thing we know about molesters, they never take no for an answer. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> I was like, fired. That was one of his tamer jokes he wrote today. It has I got to say, last night I was super surprised at how many people were following that election. At the, the card shop, yeah, yeah. I kind of was too. I was shocked at the results. but and I was shocked at that as well. And even on Twitter, like every magic person I follow was commenting about it. Well. So. Maybe that means our country's moving in the right direction, finally. I am somewhat optimistic. Yes, me too. Max also got a shout-out on his second favorite podcast. That would be Commander Cookout. They are the silver medal winners of (laughs) Max's uh, favorite Commander podcast behind us. And I want to say there's nothing wrong with second best. That's perfectly fine. No, not at all. Thank you, Ryan and Brando, for the shout-out. And uh, keep putting out the good work. I enjoy listening to you guys every week. And you know what? There's, There's... That's acceptable to be your second favorite um because i will say this my second favorite bacon is canadian bacon and they are canadian so it's kind of a fitting no. <laughs> chris is shaking his head no. chris likes canadian bacon i like canadian bacon ham yep. it's just glorified ham pretty much it's, it's, it's got a little ham. it's got a little bit of different <laughs> flavor but i'm not a bacon person so i we shouldn't be starting a uh, international Can- canada incident. u.s war considering the fact that we're celebrating the fact that we managed to barely not elect a pedophile <laughs> yay <laughs> us <laughs> we barely didn't do it. Hashtag winning. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, you guys can find us on social media. Uh, search us up on Twitter at CMDR Central. Search us on Facebook, CMDR Central. Or find us online at CMDRCentral.com. 
And as we were just mentioning, uh, all those comments were on the Doran deck tech we did in our first Dex Uplay episode. For that, the user uh, subscribed to our Patreon uh, for a couple months, and we appreciate the support. So if you would like us to do a Dex Uplay episode on one of your decks, head over to Patreon by searching CMDR Central and uh, look us up. All right. Speaking of hashtag winning, let's talk about winning, or more specifically, win conditions and magic. So this was inspired by a couple of different things. Um, First of all, Max on this show and in person has said a few times that he needs a better, more reliable win condition in his Brago deck. Don't know what your problem is. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Chris, Chris. doesn't need a more reliable win condition in Max's Brago deck because he just wins with it. I go too aggro with it, I think, is my big problem. It is a, definitely a more finesse deck than, Here's say, a question Trubuka. for you with that deck. When do you play the deck? Is it the first deck you play at night or the last deck? Depends on my mood. Last that, night it was the first deck I played. Okay, usually with that type of deck, for me, it's one of the first I have to play because it's so intensive on your brain power. It is, yes, yeah. for sure. I, I, the deck just hates me recently. It just <laughs> last night I mauled the six and barely. If you want to pull it apart, I'll build it and play it for you. Oh, thanks. Yep. I'm um, never pulling it apart. I put too much money. <laughs> no, yeah, I was going to say I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> just change it out to Lavinia the tenth. You'll be fine. Just swap the two. Yep. Uh, one of the second things that got me thinking about this is we've mentioned in the show in the past um, playing against decks where we kind of f- were frustrated because the deck had no way to win. I can think of a conversation about a Baral deck we played, I want to say last summer at some point, where the guy just had counter spells and had no way to actually counter, do counter, anything counter, with the deck. Counter, counter, draw, 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 and let's do nothing else. And we kind of offhandedly made the point that your deck should have a way to win, but we that was it. We never like took the next step to talk about that as something you need to to bake into your decks. Um, and the third thing I want to mention um, that kind of inspired this was I've talked about my neighbor who's getting into magic. Um, that would be the him and his friend, um, Dr. Long and Dr. Albano, Mike and Steve. I've talked to them quite a bit about building decks because like, they've had questions about how many draw spells, how much ramp, how many, you know, whatever. But I've never actually said to them, by the way, you should think of how your deck is going to win. Like, come up with uh, whether it's cards that are going to make you win or or just a game plan in general, like understand how you put the game away. That kind of got me thinking that we should talk about that here. So first things first, maybe we should just define what we mean by win conditions in Commander. Yeah. So in EDH, uh, win conditions come in a variety of different ways. They can be cards that just win you the game, like Feldar Sovereign. Uh, You know, when you have 40 or more life at your upkeep, you win. There are cards that work together to help you win the game like a, a creature heavy deck or they can be a deck that puts you the the game state in a spot where you lock out your opponents having mentioned feldar sovereign quick i will ask this trivia question see if anybody knows how many cards in in magic just win you the game like they strictly legitimately say win the game when you do this thing you guys have any guesses i'm gonna guess five twelve I was going to guess 12 at first because I thought that was like a nice round number. I figured it was probably going to be less, but I, I was going to guess 12 to be careful. 21. Holy there are, cow. There are 21 there are... cards that just win you the game, whether it's Feldar Sovereign based on life or uh, Biovisionary does it based on number of copies of Biovisionary in play, um, Approach the Second Sun. I won't go through the whole, whole list, but we'll put it on YouTube um, in the show notes. Oh, yeah. There's I never, yeah. never crossed my mind like the Biovisionary, Hedron Archive, that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. Hedron Alignment, pardon. Helix Pinnacle is one of them. Dark Soul Reactor. I think the most recent one would be uh, Revel in the Riches. Yes, Revel in Riches, which is which I'm thinking about putting in my list of the trader deck. Making all those treasure tokens. Oh, no. <laughs> well, that's a deck I will mention that I kind of struggle a little bit with win conditions. Yes. Um, it's a it's tough to kill me, but... It, but Oh, it's a pain to kill you. But it's, there's often times, situations where I just have to grind you out three life at a time. It's, dare I say, deadly. Because yeah. it's all oh. death touch. Oh! <laughs> Max is on. Um, so, so first things first, is this something that you guys have always thought about? Or in, in, is, are you just thinking about win conditions now that you've gotten to be better builders? Um, I would have to say now as I've become a more matured player, I think about more than just the creature win condition. Like I always think about how you're going to win the game. Right. But if that is taken away from you, I never thought about that before. But now, you know, later in life, it's something that I do think about. Yeah, I, I kind of am the same way. I, it's, it's, I've looked at it more closely as I become a more mature player playing the game. You know, when I started playing five years ago, I just slapped 99 cards together. You and just built the deck. Yeah, okay, I hope I win. And now it's more, this is how I win with this deck. 
how do I win with this deck? Stuff like that. Yep. So so uh, so give me an example. Give me one of your decks and tell me what the plan is and what your win conditions are in that deck. We'll go fancy and we'll use my Alesha deck for instance. Um, I create a bunch of tokens with her, so I can do creature beats with uh, some enchantments, or I can do uh, Perforos ping everybody out, or I can get real fancy and come swinging in at you and be like, whoa, 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 wait, I'm going to entomb my Master Cruelties and bring him back with the Luscious Trigger and just kill you one shot. Nice. So it's it's definitely combat-based, Yes. Um, creature-based, but you have multiple paths within that creature base to win. You can either go wide, you can, I'm assuming there's a Catherine's Crusade in there. Yes, there is. So you can go tall, you can go with tricks, you've got just a bunch of different ways with that deck you can kill people. Yep. And even if I don't go, you know, one, you know, select one, throughout the game other options do show up. That's perfect. Uh, Max, what do you got for examples? So let's talk about my Dromoka deck. Creature Beats is the main way that I win in that game. I mean, it's compromised of all flyers. The the plan for that game is ramp, ramp, ramp. Drop Dromoka so I can cast all my other flyers. And whether it's swinging wide with three or four flyers at one single player is what I always try to do. I always take one player down at a time. Don't go against the whole table. I also pack combat tricks, whether it's Hunter's Prowess or a Berserk. And then I can mirror pull either of those to just pump my creatures to get the commander damage or just the lethal beats in against everybody. I mean, that deck is very much a game plan deck where you're going to out-resource people while simultaneously out-damaging them. Yes. You also have a slight advantage with that deck because it seems every time I play it, you're always 10 to 20 life more than anybody else at yes, the same that, time. That is true. I do have four or five different lifelink creatures in there along with Angelic Skirmisher, which I can choose to give all my creatures lifelink at each combat if I were to do so. And because of Dromoka's ability, people can't respond to what you do in combat. Yep. Oh, they, and that is such a fun thing because it happens every game. No, happened, you can't do that. It happened last <laughs> night. We had one last night. <laughs> Someone went to do an end of turn. White Sun Zenith. To put, you know, like eight cats in play and like, oh, I can't because of Dromoka. I slammed my car down. And I went, no! <laughs> right in the face. And somehow you could hear the shame. The, you, just, you just heard over the, the storms. All these heard a wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I I still make that mistake. It wasn't me doing it last night, but it, I still do the same thing. Um, I will use, for example, my my Veil of the Nightclad deck, which is one of my newest decks. Veil gives all your creatures intimidate, and it's an artifact deck in this case. So I'm running artifact shenanigans, but artifact beaters as well. Stuff like um, Orm Coil Engine and Mer Battle Sphere that Vila essentially makes unblockable. Yep. So I have artifact shenanigans to get resource advantage there. I'm going to make most of those guys unblockable with my commander. And then my commander also has the opportunity to use something like Red Replication um, because she has an ability where whenever a creature I control leaves play, it deals one damage to each opponent. So if I Red Replication onto Vela, make five copies that all leave play, but they all see each other, so that's five times five triggers. It's actually six times five because one stays in play. So that's 30 damage off a kick Red Replication to the whole table. Um, so I also, in addition to being able to combat damage people out and and the artifacts then synergizing with all the artifact shenanigans you do in that kind of deck, I have additional win conditions that aren't based on swinging. So I know how that deck's going to win. And you know how Dromoka's going to win. And I know when I see your Lesha deck, I know what I have to watch out for. If I see Catherine's Crusade come out and you are making tokens, <laughs> I'm just dead. Like I have to deal with Catherine's Crusade or you're dead. Rust in Peace is a great answer for that deck. Yes, it is. Oh, that's one of the reasons I haven't played that deck in a long time was the amount of graveyard hate that has been showing up lately. It just turns that whole deck off. Oof. It's it's such a weird thing, too. It's so random. Like You see those games where someone has a graveyard-reliant deck, and their graveyard hate is just there. And then you see those sometimes those games where you don't see anything, but no one's really doing much to abuse it anyway. So I, right. it's such a weird thing. Um, anyway, those are some examples we use for, like, us thinking about win conditions in our decks. Let's talk about, first of all, cards that are win conditions. Um, maybe we'll go through each color. Um, sure. So, Where Catherine's you Crusade, you just okay, mentioned yeah, white. Start with white. Okay. You just <laughs> mentioned it. So, what else is there in white that did, like, cards that in, in a certain deck just win you the game? How about True Conviction? Um, True Conviction is in your Dromoka deck. Yes, it is. It's in my Sphinx deck. My nemesis. <laughs> and it wins me games in that Sphinx deck. It wins me games in Dromoka. It is literally the card that when it hits the field, if I don't have a removal spell, I'm really regretting using it earlier. Yes. Because number one, you probably kill somebody because you've doubled the amount of damage that's coming through. 
And number two, then you're putting yourself, because of the life link, probably out of range of dying. What kind of blows my mind is every now and then you see that player going, oh, he just dropped a true conviction. He has one one five seven flyer out. Oh, that's not going to do much to me. That's 10 life ten swing damage. Right there. It's a 20 life swing. It's 10 damage, oh, and they're yep. gaining 10 life. Right. That's and, a huge swing. And right there, that should be like, okay, yeah, 20 life between the two halves is a lot of a lot of life, and people just don't grasp that. Like Chris said, I blew my removal on something probably equally as threatening or something that was hindering you from doing more in the game, but now this true conviction dropped. I hope someone has an answer for it is what you're looking I for. I know I've played against your Sphinxes before, and it's like, okay, Rhystic Studies out there. I burned my one enchantment removal that I had in the hand, yep. and then like three turns later, you're like, true conviction. You're just like... Oh, I really wish that Rhystic Study was back right now. Well, I thought that last night, actually, against your Yurtle deck, um, I had a Deglamour in hand and a Beast Within early on. Yep. Like, turn two or three, I, I either had them in my opening hand or I drew them very quickly. And I was like, okay, if I can I can deal with, you know, whatever the worst enchantment that comes down is. I'm like, normally I would want to use these on that Sylvan Library or something else. I'm like, I can't. Like, I have to save this removal for his win condition cards. Yep. Which means you have to sometimes let the stuff that gets you to the point where you win the game go. But you have to. like You sometimes just have to do that. I think that that also lends itself, though, that type of thinking to knowing your opponent's decks. Yeah. Like, we know each other's decks, like, probably just as well as we know our own. Yep. And that probably can be said for a lot of people in our play group or at our LGS. We know what's in Blake's Gonti deck. We know what's in Lucas's uh, Orzov partner deck. Oh, that deck's so fun to but, play against. But if you walk into a different shop or you're at a GP with a bunch of strangers, do you think they have a true conviction in their deck or do you blow that beast within on that Sylvan Library? Or then you might wind up saving, like, okay, well, I can't kill that Sylvan Library because I need to save this removal spell for something else. And if nothing else, like they're playing a deck where like there's no win condition and they just draw a bunch of cards of Sylvan Library and you wind up losing because you kept waiting for a better target. I think this is my new goal in life. If someone ever beast was in in my Yurl deck, I'm going to suit up that beast and kill him back with the token that they gave me. <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> the vengeance kill. Um, so what else is there in white? Um, what do you guys think about like a beacon of immortality? Something that puts you so far out of range? It's not really a win condition necessarily, but it kind of is because then it, it lets you get to your win condition. Yes. I think against the right decks, like if you're just, if you're not doing something abusive with your life, like a hatred or even in mono white you're not playing storm herd or storm herd is a win condition <laughs> right yes, it is. <laughs> uh, or felled our sovereign or those type of cards and you're just doing it to double your life total if you're playing against decks that aren't heavy on the commander damage yes that is a win con in my okay. opinion if you're not facing against a ural and a dromoka and a, a madomi that can hit you with commander beats and you're playing against more comboy decks or just i think beacon of Mor- immortality is a great win con because if you double your life total at 36, you're at 72. Yep. I mean, even if it's not technically winning you the game, it's setting you up to win the game. It's it's putting you in the position to win. You might not win like that turn, but like it gets you there where you're going to win the game unless someone responds yep. to it. And to be clear, we're not saying these cards work in every deck. Like There are plenty of decks where True Conviction isn't doing you any good. No, that triple white. Ugh. I mean, it, it, right, it's tough to cast. Um, if you're running a, a weenie token deck, double strike, giving making your guys two twos isn't necessarily that great. When you could just cast Dictate of Heliod and make them three threes at fl- at instant speed because it has flash. Yep. But these are cards like in someone's particular build, they will win you the game. Dictate Heliod will win you the game in a token deck if you're going wide and someone's not ready for it. Right. And you're swinging with eight tokens and they're like, oh, I'll just take eight damage. Flash, you're taking 24. Yep. You just died. Now, there's decks where that's not going to do that. It's not going to do you much good in your Jamoka deck. You're not going to run Dictate of Heliod in that deck. No. But there are decks where it absolutely is a win condition. Um, so what else is there in white that you guys think of? Mass land destruction. I mean, we, we, we don't really run it or we're not huge fans of it necessarily, but like, I get it. It's a, if you're playing, I was an angel of hope and you Armageddon, you win the game. Yeah. <laughs> Unless I cyclonic rift you. <laughs> and balance your I wish I would have seen the look on that kid's face. I really <laughs> wish. He actually, he was cool about it. He's like, oh, well, that's what happens. He wasn't like upset. I don't think I'd be upset. I'd just like look and be like. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, that okay. happened. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, in that deck or like in. Can um, I just take that Armageddon back? <laughs> right. right. <laughs> Can I but, take my rift back? <laughs> <laughs> but in like Kalia or something where, you're, right. where you don't need lands to put stuff on the field, if you've got a handful of dragons and a Kalia out and you Armageddon, you're going to win the game. Yep. Yeah. 
So these aren't all the ones. We're not going to probably try to cover every win condition. We're just going to give you an example of what we want you to think about and build your deck. So these are some of the ones in white. Um, how about blue? What's in blue that you think of for win conditions? Lab Maniac. I mean, or Cyclonic Rift that we just yes. mentioned. <laughs> yeah, Cyclonic cyc- Rift. Um, lab Man, too. The lab, like, we'll start with Lab Man. I mean, that's a win condition in a ton of decks. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also, I've seen it played badly where someone's like, I'm going to play a Lab Man and hopefully I can get down to Nothing. no cards in the next 30 turns. No, but, pretty much you, when you play Lab Man, you need to be ready to just go off right then and there. But I've lost plenty of games to a Lab Maniac, for sure. Me too. Um, Cyclonic Rift. Cyclonic Rift wins games. If played properly, it does win games, yes. It doesn't like, guarantee a win, but none of these cards guarantee a no. win, but like Rift makes it a lot easier. Yes. Um, I guess if we're going blue, what do you guys think about like Ginja Taxes? Ginja Taxes? Whatever. I cannot pr- <laughs> never pronounce his name taxes. properly. The blue Praetor. Yep. Well, how about we just talk about Praetors in general, I guess, because most of them are super powerful. I mean, there's a bunch of those kind of cards that if you successfully resolve it, and you're in the right board state, you win the game. Yep. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about a few in different colors, um, but but to to stick with blue specifically, Ginger Taxes, if it hits and sits, sits on the field and everyone has to pitch their hand, you're probably going to win. Or you would hope. You would hope. I mean, you're generally going to generate a lot of hate. I think that's going to paint a massive bullseye on you, but absolutely, that's that that is going to win games. Infinite turns in blue, like... That happens a lot. It, it's so easy to do, too. I mean, people don't see it coming a lot of times. Well, you don't go infinite. If you just cast Expropriate... Um, and you get one vote. Right, yeah. That's maybe going to win a game. Time Stretch could easily win a game. Easily. Like, even without abusing it, extra turns can win you a game. Yes. Yep. Granted, um, I've seen it backfire. I've seen someone Time Stretch and be like, turn <laughs> one, play land, pass. Turn two, play land. I didn't I, get what I was looking for. I believe my neighbor Steve did that a week or two ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Eight mana to draw two cards, or ten mana to draw two cards, technically. But, uh, I mean, but that's not always, that, there's times you're just going to win. Yep, I mean, it's, I suppose if you're not, like, abusing it and you're just playing those extra turn spells, then it sets you up to win, then, at least. Uh, Madomi, the Ageless, the Ange- wins me a ton of games in my Sphinx deck, as well. Like, Madomi and True Conviction... In addition to having flying beaters, which is often successful as well in a control shell, um, but Madomi and True Conviction win me games. Blue's got um, things like infinite mana to blue sun Zena somebody to death. There's those kind of combos. There's Dead Eye Navigator. There's oh Dead Eye Navigator. I've totally played it in Max's Brago deck with Dead Eye Navigator. But... It's a fun card. Well, and to talk about cards that maybe are a little I don't want to say obscure, but like specific to a deck. Um, gravitational shift in my Talran deck wins me games. Uh, it's an enchantment that gives all flyers, and it's not just yours, it's all flyers, but it gives all flyers plus two plus zero, and non flyers minus two minus zero. So, number one, it can be defensive against like a goblin deck or an elf deck, it can shut them down. But in my case, it's usually I've got six drakes flying, and no one is too worried about that until they suddenly it's become four much, four. Pretty much a dictated Heliad for just your for flyers. Blue, for blue. Yep. And blue, which no one is ready for. Right. And that, I mean, I've won a ton of games dropping that when someone wasn't ready for it. Yeah, I remember the first time you ever played that, I was just like, wow, that's a good card. And there's not a lot of decks where I would run it, yep. necessarily, but it's great in that one. It's a win condition in that deck. Uh, how about black? Why don't we start off with our most recent pet card of Torment of Hailfire? Torment. Um, I would I, I kind of have Torment slash Exsanguinate here because they play similarly. Yes. Black yep. has the ability to make so much mana, um, even if you're not using Cabal Coffers, which is among itself kind of a win condition. Yeah, I was going to say, can't we just label Cabal Coffers like a win condition yeah, in I mean, Black? I definitely think we can. Mono black. The amount of resources you get ahead by being able to make that much mana oftentimes just will win you the game. Yep. Um, but being able to Exsanguinate somebody for 12 or 14 or something... Well, the whole table, that is one person. It hits everybody. Yep. And you gain mm-hmm. all that life. So you go up 30 or 40 life, and everyone else's life total gets dropped in half. And then you can then one-shot them easily from that point on. Yep. Absolutely, it's a win condition. Both yeah. those cards. We can go into a Gray Merchant does the same thing, then. Gray Merchant. your devotion. Such a good card. I mean, is Gray Merchant, I don't know if I'd call it the best 
black creature, but man, it might be. It's definitely oh, up. It's definitely guy. up there. I think he's in the top three. I, I would, yeah, for sure. I mean, that's a disgustingly strong card. He is definitely on the podium somewhere. I, I don't think he's all that great after his ability resolves, but he's right. a real good when he comes Ex- in. Except for you don't just resolve it; you resolve it, and then you sacrifice him, and you reanimate him. And like no one plays Gray Merchant once. <laughs> like, Gray Merchant comes out a bunch of times. I've tried to do it multiple times, but usually they shut me down yeah, immediately. Right. It's like, oh, he's out now. Nope, never coming back. A Gray Merchant and a Panharmonicon or a Conjurer closet is Ooh, dangerous so good and like everything like te- like like the gravitational shift great merchant isn't going to win games in a five color deck or a th- probably even a three color deck because you don't have the devotion but in a bl- mono black deck in the certain deck where you're going to run it it's going to win you a game uh what else oh max mentioned one more previously as a black one hatred yeah i love hatred yeah, you don't see many people playing that. It's it's a reserve list card. It's old. It's like a five dollar card. But it's though. cheap. It, it it shouldn't be. If you don't own um, this is a PSA for anyone listening. If you don't own a copy of Hatred right now, buy a copy of Hatred because it's not going to stay five or six bucks forever. It's on the reserve list. It wins games. It will not stay that cheap forever. On TCG Player, they are currently six dollars and ninety one cents according to Scryfall. Oh, they're going up in price then. So look at. Someone you know who's listening to this podcast with you and say, buy me that for Christmas because I need a hatred. Yeah, I remember when I bought mine, it was five bucks. So that was four months ago. So, yeah, they've gone up in price since then. But, like, if if this time next year you told me hatred was a $20 card. I would not be surprised. I would not be remotely surprised. I would regret not buying multiples. Yes. Exquisite Blood Sanguine Bond. I mean, it's a cheesy combo, but, like, it wins you the game. Yes, it does. It's one of the most commonly played combos I ever see. And it just, oh, it irks me every time because it's just like, okay, I stick this one. You're like, okay, you're just going to do some cool things with it. And then you stick the other one and you're just like, oh, Ooh. so that's how you're winning the game. Okay, yeah, sure. Right. Let's just start over. I tend to have that attitude too when I say that. But I understand it because both halves are good. Yes. But it's one of those combos where you don't need both halves. Like running one or the other is still really good. Yes. Yep. Like for instance, I run Exquisite Blood and Mogus just for the life gain because you gain so much I, life off that card. I Mogus. ping you out and I gain the life, and I need that life because well, I'm getting hated on by three people at that time. It's a win condition of Mogus because so much damage is being dealt that you you get out of range to be killed. Yep. Yep. And in Lycia, I was running the other one because I was doing so much damage. Because the other one is when you gain life, target opponent loses life. Right. Yeah. Yes. I was because she has life link and she gets big fast. I was I could one shot someone with Lycia. And, and then, then turn around and one shot someone else yep. with the Sanguine Bond trigger. Yeah. Or a Chandra's Ignition, and Sanguine Bond works really good on a Life Link creature. Oh, so Chandra's Ignition. Ooh. Well, let's jump to red. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> let's talk about that Chandra's Ignition, Arc Bond, that kind of stuff. I ran them both in my Brian Stoddarm deck um, when, I, when I had the King of Swing, King of Fling. Oh, I want him to come back. That was such a fun deck to play against. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to attack you with this creature, and I'm never going to see him again. <laughs> <laughs> I like uh, that was a fun deck to play, um, but yeah, if if you have a commander who has a life link, Chandra's ignition puts you out of range pretty frequently. I mean, you're going to kill most of the board, and you're going to gain, I mean, thirty life or seventy life or a hundred life depending yep. on what the board state is. It's a, another card that is in my Ural deck that just randomly, if you get it online with him big enough, you can just nuke the table out. Right. Yeah. For sure. Um, when I think of red win conditions, I think of spell doublers. Yeah. Um, there's a few in blue, which we could have maybe mentioned it there, but like... Wind cast, I guess. Yeah, but but blue also doesn't have necessarily spells that win the game when you double them, aside from maybe extra turn spells. Yep. Red men being able to double that earthquake or that fireball or that... Fall of the Titans. Fall of the Titans, right. I mean, that, that was a deck. Like, I played Goggle Ramp and Standard when it was a thing. Doubling Fall of the Titans with, with Pyromancer's Goggles won me so many games out of the blue. Like, I won multiple games at sub-5 life when I hadn't done a single damage to a person by casting Fall the Titans and copying it. Yep. yep. And in Commander, that's the way you got to do it. Like, it's tough to burn one person down, but when you can oh, burn everybody tough. down, yeah. that's a different thing. So I suppose we could talk about, like, a little burn, like, for everybody. You can talk about your Perforos Impact Tremors, um, all that kind of stuff. There Warstorm are, Surge. There are decks where Warstorm Surge or Impact Tremors, um, Perforos win you the game. Yep. yep. You play, you know... This is in play, and you're like, next turn, I'm going to see a fire cat blitz putting nine tokens down, and I, I'm just going to die. Uh, anything else? Red insurrection. Insurrection is a terrible win condition <laughs> in red because it's a, it seems like a crutch. You don't do anything all game. You cast insurrection. You take everybody else's stuff, and you win just because you drew the card. I, it's one of my salt generators. Like I, when I lose insurrection, it always annoys me. And it literally seems like 
that's how they win with that card. Even though I know, like, I've seen personally, you know, people that I play with a lot. I'm not going to name any names, Frank. Where I know that the deck should be playing normal, and he's just not doing anything, and all of a sudden he hits Insurrection. Yeah. And it's game over, and it's just like, okay, uh, I hate that card so bad, but, I mean, I know that the deck should have been doing something else. Yes. You feel like, okay, well, this person's done nothing, so I don't got to worry about that right now. I can focus on these players. And build, you know, I'm building a big board. I'm playing good magic. I'm building up a board set. I'm going to win. Oh, I just died to my own stuff. Yep. To the player who didn't do anything. Yeah. But I mean, I, it's a it's a fair card. Costs a ton of mana and it's sorcery speed. And I mean, I don't think it's busted, but it wins games. A, ho- a homeward path stops it. It does. Yeah. <laughs> it does for sure. <laughs> and that's why we run them in the majority of our decks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, what do you guys think about uh, Bear of the Heavens? Um, it's a rattle. It, it stops people from wanting to attack you or block your stuff for sure. Yeah, yep. I mean, and at a ten ten body, he's pinging for damage. Yep. And if you're running like an indestructible based deck, you know you wipe the board and you still have your whatever beat stick, your red yep. god, your perf- whether it's Perforos or right. anything indestructible yeah. because he destroys all permanents. So your lands go too. So right. he kind of falls in that mass land destruction. Yeah, but I, I think he would be better than an Armageddon because he's doing something as well. Right. Red has quite a few of those, whether it's, is it Jokola Hops? I'm not sure you pronounce that. Yep. But there's Armageddon, multiple different. Or not uh, Armageddon, Armageddon's but, uh, white, but there's a couple different red ones whose names are escaping oh, me at this yeah. time. There's the Uncounterable one that's mm-hmm. eight mana or something. Um, so there's multiple different ones in red that destroy all lands. Obliterate. That's the obliterate. red one I was yep. thinking of. So yeah, that's, I mean, just like as in white, if you're in the right position, that, that wins you the game. Yep. Um, I was thinking of Catrudus Violence. I've lost to a bunch of times, or Dictate of the Twin Gods. Twin Gods, yep. Oh, yeah, doubling the damage. I suppose if we were going to go that route, you could do Red has possibly the best, if not all, of the extra combat step ones. Yes. Yeah. I, I, right, absolutely. Those win you games. Yep. I can't think of any of the names of them even right now. Um, I mean, obviously, there's stuff like, is it Aurelia that has a... Aurelia has Seize one. Seize the Day. Seize the yep. Day is one. Flashback. There's the Enchantment where you can spend five mana a turn... Yep, the I think hel- you can only do it once or twice yeah. or something like that. There's a Hellkite that does it. Scourge of the Throne, if you are on the throne, you get yep. an extra combat yep. step. Yeah, that's th- those can be devastating as well. Like, you're, you're, you're not ready for the double damage, and all of a sudden it's there. And then double triggers, too. Double combat triggers, in some cases, on some of those decks. And then you have your, like you were just talking about, your Dictate of the Twin Gods, so it's like double damage upon yeah. double combat step. And <laughs> your Twin's Violence comes on, you're taking double damage from that. You bet. And there's also combos in red, Kiki conscripts, that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Kiki Jiki. Yeah, forgot about him. <laughs> How about in green? Green is number one in my mind when it comes to like creature beats, whether it's spiraling a thousand elves onto the battlefield or and followed up with a crater hoof or playing your beasts or just all the big fatty green creatures that you can. Yeah, I think green is just perfectly on curve with their creatures. Like, when a creature comes down, he's on curve for what he needs to do, his ability, his power and toughness, whereas others kind of fluctuate. Yeah. There's a lot of synergy there as well in green. Green has big creatures, and then something like Overwhelming Stampede ties in with that, or Overrun, to a lesser extent, Crater Hoof. I mean, look at the cat deck, that Arabo deck. You know, if you've got Arabo sitting in your, even if it's in the command zone still, and you play whatever cat it is, and you give it plus three, plus three, or you, then you get Arabo out and you double that creature's power, and then you cast an overwhelming stampede, all your guys are getting plus 20, plus 20. That's yep. really easy to do in that Arabo deck. And I suppose, uh, I know Max had mentioned this t- to us earlier, but uh, with uh, you're able to do that a lot easier than other colors because of the ramp that you have in green. Yeah. Graham, green gets you in a position to cast those things. Very true. And now that green, as the game has gotten a little more advanced, green has the draw more draw aspect in it now. Yeah. In the color pie to help refuel your hand when you cast two or three ramp spells a turn. Unless you're and building a, a Doran deck where a lot of those green draw <laughs> don't, spells don't work. Don't work. <laughs> right. Berserk. Max friends Berserk in his remote deck. And Ber- Berserk kills people. Yep. It's, I don't know if I'd call it green's hatred, but it kind of is. Mm-hmm. It's awfully darn close. For one mana? One mana, easily copyable with anything. Um, and there's, there's some green combo kind of things, too, that aren't necessarily combat-based, like food chain. There's enough food chain combos I've seen, or... Um, yep. Bir- birthing Pod yep. has some combos that you can do in green that get you to win the game. And then you containment priest them when they sack to Birthing Pod. <laughs> right, right. Because <laughs> they're forced to bring the thing in and then it gets exiled. Then you have the, the cards like Tooth and Nail and Defense of the Heart that just, if they aren't dealt with, you can bring out your Critter Hoof and your 
world spine worm and just go to town. That was survival of the fittest band in commander. I do not remember. It is not. No, it's just it that's another really good one that yeah. could be Expensive. in there. Though. Yeah, there are situations where being able to get that creature both sacrifice one that you can then recur and get a new one to replace it as well. In Marin, I mean, that's a re- that's a win condition of Marin. You're going to yep. generate so much value off that. Very true. Um, and it's just a good card in general. Uh, anything else specifically in green that anyone can think of? can't really think of just as green as a color by itself. I mean, I can think of splashing colors into it where it could do other stuff. But other than that, I can't really think of just green as itself. Right. There, there's so many overrun effects. Is that that's the main one that I think of that we mentioned. But there's a bunch of different ways to do that. Mm-hmm. I think. I guess the biggest thing that I can think of just just popped in my head with green is trample. Yes. Yes. Because I think green is the the color of trample. Yes, I agree. And I think red has a few trample things too. White might have one or two, maybe. Be some that I'd have to look up. But yeah, with that trample effect, that's definitely I think a win con because it's like, well, most colors I have a whole bunch of weenies that are just gonna you know chump block me. Well, I'm going to send this 10-10 at you. Go for it, chump block. You're still going to eat so much damage over the top. Boom, trample. Yeah, yep. it, it's, it functions a bit like the plus two, plus two dictated heal yard where it changes your combat math. I, oh, I'm fine. I can block this stuff. Oh, no, I can't. The damage is coming through. And then Wizards has a nice little you know, thing that irks me all the time where they hide the keyword trample on cards. I swear on to God, the they bo- do. On the bottom, <laughs> beneath all the other text. Um, how about colorless? I think colorless has stuff like Eldrazi Monument, which is... Maybe that, not a win con, but ex- a, a highly enabler. It kind of, it, like, that's the number one one I had. I don't think it's the best one, but that's one that comes to my mind because I, we see token decks in our meta, and there's been a bunch of times when I've been, okay, there's, it's only seven or eight tokens, and I've got blockers, who cares? Oh, man, something they all have flying, and, and they all got plus, plus one, plus one, plus one. And that doesn't seem that significant looking at the card. When you're going against a token deck, that is significant. That makes a huge difference. It's huge. So giving them all evasion and giving them the plus one has killed me a bunch of times. I guess um, maybe Darksteel Forge if you're playing all colorless, giving yeah. all your stuff indestructible, and then you can just yeah in an, wild, arf- crazy in an artifact deck. You bet. I was also thinking of Mind Slaver. Yeah, you don't have to be in other lock. colors to enable it, but like Mind Slaver wins games. It's a win condition. I don't run it in my Glissa deck anymore, but I did, and it it was a win condition in that deck. Okay. And then why don't we just mention the big nasties, I guess? Like the Blightsteel. Al- the Eldrazi's. The Al- yeah. Right, they're colorless. Eldrazi's, Blightsteel, Colossus. Right, if you resolve most of those Titans, you're probably going to win. Yep. Yeah. Lands. Um, so I can think of one, <laughs> but I'm assuming everyone's thinking the same one. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm thinking Dark Depths. <laughs> I was going to say Valkut. Okay, that's another one. Uh, Westell Abbey as well. Oh, yeah, I, didn't know I played that, that in Elisha too. How did I forget that one? <laughs> but we mentioned Cabal Coffers too. Yep. And I think Nykthos to a lesser extent. Nykthos is a win condition sometimes. G- glacial Chasm? It ca- yeah, it's yeah. an enabler. At no, least it lets you pillow fort yourself long enough to be able and to get your... And Solemnity and you just go, oh, you can't do nothing. Uh, uh, mirror Pool. I've seen Mirror Pool win games because... It, Max, <laughs> what are you talking about? I don't need three Archangel Thunes. What are you talking about? Right, exactly. <laughs> I suppose a lot of the good utility lands could be considered close to win condition. Like you get you on that uh, in the in the right deck for sure. Spells uncounterable, stuff like that. Okay, so w- w- like clearly we're not going to try to. That wasn't an attempt to go through over all of them. We're trying to illustrate yep. what we're talking about here. Yeah. Um, and they don't work in every deck, like we said. But look at your deck because there are cards that in your deck are going to let you win games. Um. So how about this? Do you guys watch and prepare for other people's win conditions? I think this kind of goes on saying that we know each other's decks just as well as we own our know our own. Right. So like, am I going to waste my Croson grip on your Sylvan Library or am I going to save it for your true conviction? Those mental choices are what we kind of make every week when we play. And, and what, the more people build, bake in will, win conditions, the more you kind of have to be ready for it. I think the biggest one that I always pay attention to is when I see blue, I'm always counting their lands. Seven. Always. Se- seven mana for Rift. I, I, I think we mentioned this. Um, this show is airing before... The round table. Our round table that we're going to be airing Christmas week, but we recorded it already. It, Cyclonic Rift took up about five or ten minutes of conversation <laughs> yes, during the round table. But one of the points I made was I genuinely... There are situations where I will target and kill a blue player simply because Rift will be what turns the game around. And okay, no one else is playing blue, and I can survive anything else except for a Rift. I'm going to kill the blue player. 
Yeah, I suppose aside from Rift, I don't really pay attention to like win cons. I try to play according to the board state, like what I have, what they have. Try to play it that way because honestly, I think it's the best way to play. Because if you're waiting for something to come, it might never come, and you're just holding on to all the pieces that you need right. to get rid of it, and then lose to something else. But you also, it's a tough needle to thread there because like okay i'm playing this i'm playing gave tokens and if doubling season comes out i'm gonna die like yep. it's bad or stuff's gonna Cathar's happen crusade or Cathar's crusade does that deck too. procession or any of the token the, doublers there's a bunch of them in that deck that do it pumpers um, and it's not even a, a combo gave deck it's just a value town token deck I think this this question kind of stems to the, maybe not the answer of do you plan for people's win cons, but it stems to the other answer of you need more than one win con in your deck. Yes. yes. Because if your win con is true conviction on a on a big 10-10, 11-11 beater, okay, I know that. That's the only way you win that game every week. I'm just going to wait for true conviction or I'm going to rip it out of your deck with bribery yeah. or something like that. I know, um, for instance, in my Ural deck, I've had to go with uh, Sigil of the Empty Throne out and start enchanting other people's stuff because I don't have a creature out to enchant to get my angels. Yep. So right. I can win the game. There, there are games where I win with a Luminarch Ascension in Dromoko. I can't believe someone would even let that thing stay. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> that gets out of control with that deck. For yes. Sure. So, so what do you do in a deck that doesn't have a clear win condition? So I'll use my Gliss of the Trader deck for an example. Um, that's the struggle with that deck. Um, is it's a strong-ish deck. I, yeah. I can recur a lot of artifacts and generate a lot of value and draw a lot of cards, and I'm a pain in the butt to deal with because it's a death touch deck. But I sometimes struggle with putting a game away. My creatures aren't necessarily that big. I have don't have any infinite combos. Um, I am running Exsanguinate, and I am running... Um, Torment of Hailfire in that deck because I tend to survive till turn 14 and I've got a Cabal Coffers but even without that oftentimes being the last cockroach left alive I can <laughs> kill people with those two cards I, I'm struggling in that deck to figure out how to do it so what do you guys do in those situations where you have a deck that doesn't have a clear way to win aside from maybe just grinding it out or can, or can, or can you not do anything sometimes you just maybe can't this is kind of where I am with Brago Okay. I, I've done the grinding it out I've I've played thousands of games with that deck, and I mean, it's probably like a 45-55 split of win to losses, but I'd like that consistency to be a little higher on the win side, and you got to take into account there are some matchups I'm just not going to win. I might not see the cards that help me win, but it just comes down to tearing that deck apart, whether it's on tapped out or laying it out on the table by mana cost or card type, and really looking at, okay... What cards work well together? What cards do you not need? Or what cards are there better options are? And usually that involves asking you guys or asking the play group or yep. doing my research and reading primaries on the deck online. You know, it just it's research. That's what it comes down to. Now, I know I've played your Glissa deck before, and I have noticed that it it really lacks the oomph that, like, some of my decks do. Mm -hmm. it's, but I it's noticed a slow that deck. The thing with, like, decks like that that don't really have, like, their clear win con is that you're able to play off the board more. Yes. Like other people are doing other stuff, and I might drop a Mimic Vat or something like that, or a Duplicant or whatever. Not saying you have Duplicant in there, but something like that that actually plays off what other people are doing, which allows to get you a win con for to do the game out. A lot of times I win by letting everyone else do the work and getting everyone else down to the point where I can then kill people because I'm the worst target in the field. So to, to quick mention what Matt was saying, what Bra Max was saying about Brago, the thing with Brago, and it's with my Glissa deck as well, it's not so much that they don't have win conditions that's annoying. It's that they're good decks that don't have win conditions. Yes. yes. Like my my um, my didgeridoo Mono White Planeswalkers deck. I almost won with that, too. And, and, so and, and close. It, it usually wins through tokens or Gideon Beats. Like, I know how the deck's going to win. Yep. But it's tough to get <laughs> there necessarily very easily in that deck. But that's okay. It's It's intended to be not a great deck. And any wins feel good because you managed to pull them off. Yep. Whereas that Brago deck is a good deck, and there's games when you do insane things and draw a ton of cards and generate so much resource advantage and destroy so many permanents, and you still can't put it away. And I think that's what's super frustrating. About yes. Those. In my Glissa deck's the same way. There's those games where I've recurred that Mistress Bauble 14 times in three turns because I have a Dalkin Ori out and drawn a ton of cards, and I can't get there. 
So I think that's much more frustrating when it's a good deck that does good stuff, but it still can't put it away. Yes. Yeah. I think that's really all we need to say about win conditions. It, it, it's important, though, to start factoring that in, I think, as you get to be a better and better commander player. You just need to start understanding that this isn't just sit down and let's see what happens. Um, you should have a plan to put the game away. Yep. Uh, yeah. Whether it be the same thing every time you're playing, at least then you know what the deck's supposed to do compared yeah. to just like, well, I, now I have like 30 different ways I could win. You know, try and narrow it down to this is what I need to do the focus of this deck. And some decks naturally lend themselves to having 15 different paths mm -hmm. to victory. There are decks I have that are that way. Uh, my Reki deck, I wouldn't have thought it, but like it has a bunch of different ways I can win. Whether it's Baru buffing a bunch of guys, or whether it's a big Genesis wave could have a bunch of mana doublers, or and the Chrome was Morial into in your face, and... right? Like, but there's a there's I I can win a handful of different, or just beats like the, I can generate so many creature beats that I don't even need anything else besides just swinging with the the fourteen things that I put in play. But I have an overrun too, so if I have four or five things in there, I can still kill the field with an overrun or an overrun off of. Kamal Fist of Crosa or destroy your lands when you go to to Wrath with Kamal. <laughs> but there's a lot of different ways I can win with that deck that I hadn't really anticipated when I started playing it. Yeah, I guess another thing I could point out is don't forget you always have a general. Yeah. I have died to a 2-2 two -two general who that's all he is is a 2-2 two -two and has killed me with commander damage. As have I. Yeah, I've died to ridiculous commanders before that I should never have died to. You've killed, I'm speaking of you killing me with a ridiculous yeah. commander. <laughs> but, I've, but I've also not played my commander before because I've gotten so used and I've left Asperia sitting there in my Sphinx deck when I should have played it too. Yep. And that's a, that commander's a 6-4. That's four hits to kill somebody. Yep, that's always another win condition you have in your deck is just your commander in general. Yeah. Yep. Um, all right, I think that is it for win cons. Hopefully that gave you something to think about. Uh, next week will be our round table show. Um, so I'm kind of excited for that. I th think it turned out pretty well. I do too. I had, I thought it was a lot better than what we know, were a little worried <laughs> about it. <laughs> it's Christ was, it was Christmas week. We're like, oh, let's see what happens. It's, you I know, was worried about random people just coming running in the room and, you know, yeah, and yelling out random stuff. So uh, Shout out to Phil and Savannah for keeping that room guarded to make sure that didn't happen. Phil and Savannah yep. who uh, own D20, the local game store here in Eau Claire. Where we recorded the show that you'll be hearing next week. Yes. It's uh, our Christmas present to you guys. Yeah, there we go. And we'll be back with one final show at the end of the year where we're going to do 2017 Year in Review. That'll be episode 20. Wow. Kind of symmetrical there. 20 episodes this we year. 20 are. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty uh, That's pretty cool. I, I lost count around like 11. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I know when I'm doing my notes, I'm like, wait, what episode were we on again? And I have to like scroll through and be like, okay, that's where we're at. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Until next week, I'm Dana. I'm Max. And I'm Chris. <laughs>